Hey there! It's me Eden. If you are new to the channel then please subscribe to my channel and visit my Patreon page for early access, link in the comment, thanks! The motel didn't have a wake-up service but each room did have a clock radio so we were able to wake up at 5.30. As usual I got up first and used the tub, followed by Carol. We could hear mom in the other bathroom as we were getting ready. We were almost ready to go when the driver knocked on the door a few minutes before 7. We told him that we'd be right out as I finished combing my hair and putting it into a ponytail. We grabbed our sweaters and purses and went outside into the early morning sunlight. The driver was waiting in the minivan in front of my room. We climbed in and buckled up. Mom said to the driver, where can we get some breakfast? The cook tent is open until 8 o'clock for breakfast? What do they have there? Eggs, pancakes, sausage, French toast, hash browns, cold cereals, hot cereals, muffins, donuts and pastries, toast, all the usual breakfast foods. Plus there's milk, tea, coffee, bottled water, and soda available throughout the day. Sounds like a better restaurant than most restaurants. The food is really good in this location. Better than most. Since we were only a mile from the location, it just took a few minutes to get there. According to the driver, the movie company had leased a section of land that contained buildings built for a work project back in the 1930s. The company had fixed up the exteriors and made the dilapidated buildings look like a small farm town. If you didn't look at the buildings from the back you'd never know that most of them were ready to fall down. The only reason that they were still standing is that they had been fixed up in the 60s and used as a camp for forest firefighters in training. The driver took us to the cook tent and introduced us to a production assistant, Veronica Crane, who welcomed us and invited us to have breakfast with her. We went through the food line and found some empty seats at one of the picnic tables. Veronica, Ronnie to her friends, introduced us to the cast members who were already seated at the table. As we were introduced the cast members gave me their character names as well as their real names. Ronnie had already told them that I was to be Wendy Stone in the movie. Over breakfast I was grilled about my experience. Perhaps grilled is too harsh a description but it seemed that way. I wasn't really well known, and I was the youngest member of the company, so the others were naturally curious about me. I didn't dwell on the jealousies that are a natural part of life. Most of the cast had at least heard of Oliver on board, even if they hadn't seen the show themselves. When I told them that I had last worked in A Promise of Spring with Cole Griffith and Heidi Morris, the mood seemed to soften. I guess having worked on a movie gave me a little more credibility than the television series gave me. Once we got past this point it seemed that everyone became a little more friendly. After breakfast, Ronnie took us to the director's motorhome. Mr. Marin had just finished eating breakfast and was discussing the day's shooting with the first assistant director. Mr. Marin welcomed us to the set, inquired about our accommodations, and then asked Ronnie to show us to my dressing room and get us settled. We thanked him and followed Ronnie. Ronnie took us to a trailer that had my name on the door. It wasn't enormous but it was a nice size. It had a tiny bathroom, a small kitchen area with a refrigerator, and an open area that contained a couch, several chairs, and a makeup table. At the back was a full-sized bed. A canvas awning was rolled out over the entrance providing a shady area where several lawn chairs were set up. If it had a bathtub you could live in it. Most importantly, it had air conditioning. Although the night had been cool, the day was already starting to get warm. Mom and Carol made themselves comfortable as Ronnie went over the schedule. So that we would have transportation readily available, Ronnie gave me the keys to a rented car and told me where it was parked. 
hereafter we could travel back and forth to the motel on our own. She said that the wardrobe people would be in shortly to begin working with me, and then Mr. Marin would send for me when he was ready to discuss the movie with me. Ronnie asked for my copy of the script so that they could insert the changes. After Ronnie left I familiarized myself with the trailer and then sat down to wait for the wardrobe persons. There was a radio on the counter and Carol turned it on and found some music that we all could live with. Thank goodness for our musical tolerance for country music, at least if the sound is low. About 20 minutes later the wardrobe people came. And and Vera measured me from head to foot before having me try on half a dozen outfits that they had brought with them. They pinned the clothes where alterations were required and then left. I sat back down to wait but didn't keep waiting too long. An assistant came to tell me that I was wanted at Mr. Marin's motorhome. Mom and Carol stayed at the trailer while I walked to the motor home where Mr. Marin was holding court under the awning on the entrance side. I was introduced to Alec Carsey, the male lead, Jennifer Larida, the female lead, and the other main characters. Ronnie was there and she gave me my updated script. During the meeting I learned that they had not delayed the start of shooting for me only altered the schedule slightly to shoot around the scenes that I was in until I arrived. Mr. Marin read down through the list of scenes that we would be shooting this week, weather permitting, then we went through the scenes that we would be doing today. We worked until 10 a.m. and then broke to go get dressed for our first scene. The wardrobe people had delivered the clothes that I would wear so I changed and went to the area where the vans were located that would take us to the town. There were always drivers available to transport cast and crew to and from the shooting location, just around the hill and less than half a mile from the camp. One of the buildings was being used for the makeup department and I went there first so that they could do my hair and makeup, and then went to where the scene was being shot. We began practicing the scene and kept at it, while Mr. Marin made slight changes or gave us direction, until he was ready to shoot. The camera and sound people had set up long ago and were sitting in the shade waiting for word that we were ready. When Mr. Marin gave the word, everyone sprang into action. We did a couple of more walkthroughs while sound was checked and lighting values doubled checked, then we began the takes. It took six takes before everything clicked and Mr. Marin was satisfied, then makeup came in and touched everyone up before we started doing the close ups. It was a little after one in the afternoon when we finished up and broke for lunch. We piled into the vans that would take us for the three-minute ride to the cook tent. A lot of the technicians stayed behind to begin moving the equipment to the next spot where we would be shooting. Mom and Carol were already in the tent and had saved a spot for me at the table. We sat with the same group that we had been with at breakfast. I looked around and realized that neither Alec nor Jennifer was there. They prefer to eat in their motorhomes, Ronnie said. Someone brings them their food. They also ride back and forth between here and the set in cars instead of the vans. Just some of the little perks involved in being the stars. It's been like that on every picture I've worked on. Usually the stars keep their distance from the rest of the company. I noticed that on the television series and the first movie that I was in but I thought that they were isolated cases. The isolated cases are the ones where the stars associate with the cast and crew. There are a few, but they're pretty rare these days. Rank has its privileges and all that. I heard a story about one big name that even insisted that the movie company provide a special cook just to prepare his dog's food. I resolved that if I ever got the lead in a movie, I wouldn't let it go to my head like that, but power can be intoxicating and who knows what it will do to any of us. After lunch we returned to the set and began working on the next scene. The technicians, who had worked while we ate, left for lunch as we started rehearsing. 
We finished the next scene before the sun went down too far to shoot anymore today and we began working on the first scene that we would shoot on Tuesday. When the light level got too low to work, we broke for the day. Dinner was being served when we got back to the camp so we ate and then headed home to the motel. The nice, but warm, weather continued for the rest of the week and the movie progressed fine. I began to make friends with the other people on the set. Mom and Carol, bored with sitting in the trailer, began to spend most of their time at the set, and that was how Carol wound up being in the movie as one of the townspeople extras. One day, when Carol wasn't needed, Mom and her took the car and went for a ride, not returning until dinner time. During dinner they told me that they had found a lake where we could go swimming. We worked on Saturday, but on Sunday we put our swimming suits under our clothes and headed to the spot that they had found. We had made some sandwiches from breakfast sausages and also brought some bottled water. We spread out a blanket on the shore and got a little sun, then went swimming for a while, then returned to the blanket for more sun. As the sun started to dip we returned to the motel, changed, and went to the camp to get dinner. It had been a nice, relaxing day. The following week brought some rainy weather. We couldn't shoot outdoors so we drove to the house that had been rented for the indoor shooting. The camp was about 30 minutes away, so meals for the cast and crew were brought to the house each day. By Thursday the weather had cleared so we resumed the outdoor shooting. After our day at the lake we had told a few people about it and others began to show up on Sundays. In a few weeks, it became the place to go on Sundays. Most of the cast could be found there during some part of the day. The cook tent even prepared box lunches for us to take with us. Someone set up a volleyball net and others brought blow-up floats and beach toys. There wasn't really any sand, it seemed more like clay, but that didn't stop the fun. Everyone seemed to have a good time at the lake. Although the movie wasn't an action film there were a few scenes that required stunt people. There was even a scene where my character was supposed to drive recklessly and have a car accident. I certainly wasn't good enough to do it, and it did involve some danger, so a professional stunt woman was brought in. The woman hired had an uncanny resemblance to me. She was the same size, had about the same shape, and had a very similar face. I guess that that was part of the reason why she was hired. I met Sharon Oberson on the first day that she arrived and we hit it off right away. After the first couple of weeks, the number of scenes that I was in tapered off quite a bit so I spent a lot of time sitting around. Once Sharon came to the set we spent most of my off time together. Since Sharon was only 19, I was curious as to how she had gotten into stunting. I had a boyfriend who's a stuntman. He taught me everything I know. I learned how to ride a bike, handle a car, take a fall, ride horses, just everything. When we weren't on a set, or making love, we were off doing some activity like rock climbing, scuba diving, or drag racing. And I loved it. I can't see myself doing anything else. I could never do what you do. I hate memorizing lines. Sharon was only on the set for two weeks, but we became the best of friends. I was sad to see her go when her shooting was through. It was as if Carol was leaving. We traded addresses and phone numbers before she left and we promised to keep in touch. After she left I was mildly depressed for several days. I had become friendly with Alec and Jennifer as the movie had progressed and, probably because I was in a principal supporting role, I was one of the inner circle that was welcome in their motorhomes. After Sharon left I began spending more and more time in their company, trying to divide my time between them and the other cast members whom I had befriended. Because of the remoteness of the location there was little to do during off hours, so we would get together to watch videos, play cards, or just talk. Carol, as my sister, 
was also welcomed. Mom preferred the company of older cast members and found several friends with whom to pass the time. While I never felt as close to either Alec or Jennifer as I had Sharon, I would say that we were friends. I didn't pose any immediate threat to either of their careers so they were able to relax in my company. At the beginning of August, Aunt Jessica came to join us for three weeks, rooming with Mom during her stay. When an actor isn't in a scene there really isn't any need to be on the set, so on days when I knew that I wouldn't be needed, we would go for a ride or to the lake. Mom arranged to have the catering service provide a cake on my birthday and everyone still in the cook tent after the evening meal, saying happy birthday to me. Later on, back at the motel, I received my birthday presents. Brad had sent a gift for me via UPS and I found a beautiful leather jacket when I opened the package. It was sweet of him to go through the trouble of sending it to me here at the location. I promised myself to call him and thank him in the morning. In addition to the clothes and jewelry that I received, Mom gave me a credit card with my name on it. It's your money, dear, she said. You should have access to some of it. Use it wisely. I will, Mom. I felt very grown up now that I had my own credit card, even if I was just 17. As I went into the other bedroom to try on the new clothes I thought about the coming months. In September I would become a high school senior, and although Carol would be away at college, I was looking forward to the new school year. Things might be easier in some ways. With Brad at college, I wouldn't have to worry about him getting more amorous. I felt that as soon as he was settled in at his new school he would start to make new friends and probably forget all about me. Yet as soon as I thought about it, I realized that instead of making me happy, the thought had the opposite effect on me. I didn't understand why I should be sad about Brad finding a new girlfriend. I had been telling myself for the past year that I was only interested in Debbie and that Brad was only a cover, but, for the first time, I was admitting to myself that Brad meant more to me than just a friend. But how much more was he? From the first day that I had become Crystal, I had been kissing boys. At first I had told myself that we were only two actors pressing our lips together. Then I found myself in the arms of boys who were not actors. It became personal. And, as time progressed, it had become a natural thing, for I had begun to think of myself as a woman, and what was more natural than for boys and girls to kiss. Yet, beneath it all, I knew that I wasn't a real girl and that's what confused me. I shouldn't delight in being held and kissed by boys, but I did and to make matters worse were my feelings for Debbie. I had been attracted to her from the first and I still had those feelings. It was all so confusing. As I stepped back into the other bedroom where everyone was waiting, I turned my attention back to the party and modeled the clothes. Mom put some pins in where she thought that alterations should be made. She had become friends with Anne and Vera, the wardrobe people who had responsibility for my costumes, and I knew that she would get them to make the alterations. I just hoped that they wouldn't be too tight when they were done. I no longer wore the corset most of the time, and I didn't expect that to change as long as my waist remained at 21 inches without it. Officially, my measurements were 36-21-36 and even mom felt that I didn't need the corset except for special occasions and when trying to make first impressions at new jobs, but she still wanted me to wear tight clothes most of the time. Unless I was purposely in disguise, or wearing wardrobe clothes while working, I couldn't take a normal step. When walking with mom and Carol, I normally had to take twice as many steps to keep up and I was usually in four or five inch heels. Hurrying through airports gave me the worst time because my heels echoed in the halls and gateways, while I had to waddle as I took the tiny steps that my tight skirt allowed me. Aunt Jessica stayed with us until the end of the third week in August before saying good.
Bye. And returning home. During her stay we had long discussions about our moving to California. Mom wanted me to be closer to possible work, and if we moved into the condo we would also be close to Carol. Aunt Jessica thought that our moving to California would be a good idea also. Mom had just over 20 years with the school system so she was guaranteed a retirement benefit when she reached retirement age. She could leave her job at any time although she had many years to wait before she could collect any retirement benefits. Open spaces, closed hearts wrapped up during the first couple of days in September, at least as far as the main shooting was concerned. There was another group assigned to shooting scenery shots and I didn't know if they had completed their work. There would also be weeks or months of editing and sound work to be done before it would be released. I might be called in for sound dubbing once the editing began. On the last evening we had a wrap party in the cook tent and we said our goodbyes to everyone. In the morning everyone would be packing up and leaving at random times. We would drive ourselves to the airport and leave the rental car there. Once we left the camp to go to the motel on the last evening, we didn't return. The first day home was spent getting us organized. We did laundry, cleaned the house, and responded to telephone messages. I learned that Debbie had already left for college without my having a chance to see her. Brad, because of his football scholarship, had left for school in July. Carol would be leaving for college tomorrow where she would major in communications. She wanted to live on the campus in L.A. rather than at the condo and she was all packed before going to bed so that she would be ready to leave in the morning. After loading the car on Friday morning we took Carol to the airport and waited until her plane had taken off. It was a tearful goodbye for me even though we would see her in a few days. I knew how much I'd miss her in the months ahead. Mom had arranged with a limo service to pick her up at LAX airport and take her to her dorm residence. We had a little over two weeks before school started and Mr. Daniels had requested that we come out to California for interviews, so with Carol gone we started to prepare for our own trip to L.A. in two days. Before we left, we made some time to visit Marge and Barbara at the theater. They were excited about my success and wanted to hear all about the two movies that I was in. We spent several hours talking about the movies. Mom filled in where I might have glossed over a point or two. It sounds like you've made it, honey, Barbara said. Just keep doing what you're doing and you'll wind up with a leading role soon. Maybe, but I'm content to play supporting roles, I said. I guess that we'll have to wait and see what the critics say. Neither of the movies has been released yet, but the first one should be out soon. If the movies bomb, my career may bomb with them. A couple of failed movies, added to a failed television series, would give pause to anyone considering me for a role. They've finally started showing the car commercials on television, though. Between the revenues from that and the movies, we now have enough for our college needs and that's all I ever wanted anyway. Oh, don't be silly, Marge said. The critics are gonna love ya. And you're not responsible for the series ending. That was just poor writing. Your performances were great and everyone said so. I'm sure that that played a part in getting you the movie roles. I guess. Mr. Daniels feels that if I was in California, I'd be up for a lot more work. That's for sure, Han, Barbara said. You have to be where the work is to get the jobs. But after your latest movie comes out, your name will carry a lot more weight. How was the summer production? I'm sorry to have missed it. They did a good job. We didn't get held over like last year, but everyone enjoyed it. I have a copy of the cast picture. Barbara retrieved the picture and we looked at it as she pointed out the newcomers and told us some of the things that happened during rehearsals and the performances. 
She had us in stitches when she related how, during a final dress rehearsal, one of the new male players stepped on and ripped the skirt off one of the women, then jumped backward, fell over a chair and put his arm through a scenery wall. No one was hurt physically, but the new player's ego took a beating. Fortunately, it happened during a rehearsal so only the company was there to see it. Barbara said it looked like something out of a Jerry Lewis movie. The crew had worked furiously to repair the damage to the scenery before the opening. We stayed for about another half hour, talking about acting, plays, and movies. Later that afternoon we had UPS pick up six, very large, cartons that we were shipping to California. Two of the boxes were for Carol. She could only take two suitcases plus her carry-on with her or she would have taken her entire bedroom. The other was filled with things that we wanted for the condo. We picked up a rental car when we arrived at LAX airport the next day. For today, we only plan to open the condo, air it out, pick up groceries, and get ourselves settled. After everything was done I called Carol. She didn't answer but I was able to leave a message for her that we were here and that she should call when she gets in. She called about two hours later and we spent over an hour on the phone while she told me all about her college experience so far. Mom wanted to see her dorm room and the campus so we agreed on a time for Saturday before we rang off. During the next five days I went to all the interviews that Mr. Daniels had scheduled. There were commercials, spots on television shows, and even a couple of movie roles. After each interview or reading they thanked me and said that they'd be in touch. I began to think that those words should be engraved on every casting director's gravestone. Here lies Joe Smith, casting director. He'll be in touch. On Saturday, we went over to USC and found Carol's dorm. A call from the lobby brought her running, along with her roommate and half a dozen other girls who wanted to meet her famous sister. After greetings and introductions we went up to Carol's floor. I became the center of attention and I must have signed an autograph for every girl on the floor. I guess that I expected attitudes to be more blasé around here considering the number of people in the entertainment business who lived in and around Los Angeles but I was forgetting that most of these girls were not from this area. After a number of pleas for a little privacy, we finally found ourselves alone with Carol, her roommate, and her two closest friends of the past few days. Carol was sharing a nice, spacious room with a private bath. They must have made an effort to straighten it up before we came because it hardly looked lived in. We sat around and talked for about an hour before Carol and Samantha, her roommate, took us on a tour of the enormous campus. Her friends, Carly and Shauna, said that they'd meet us later. It was almost lunchtime when we began touring the campus, so we stopped to have a light lunch in a snack bar before continuing. Carol and Samantha gave us the full tour and it was almost dinner time when we got back to the dorm. Rather than all of us going to the cafeteria we decided to go off campus to a restaurant. A quick search through the yellow pages yielded several possibilities and we settled on a seafood place about a mile from the campus. As we were getting ready to leave, Shauna and Carly showed up to see if Carol and Samantha were ready to go to the cafeteria, so we invited them along also. The six of us squeezed into the mid-sized compact a favorite oxymoron of the car rental industry, that mom had rented and drove to the restaurant. Over dinner I was besieged once more with questions about the movies. Carol had been there and had probably already told them all about it but I graciously answered every question again. People love to hear the inside dope which is why there are so many gossip columnists and newspeople in the business. We dropped Carol and the others off at the campus a little after 8 and drove home to the condo. On Sunday we just relaxed. I spent most of the afternoon at the poolside. Chet and Bud, the boys that Carol and I had met previously, came out for a swim. 
Crystal, it's nice to see you again. Where's Carol? Chet asked. She's over at USC. She started school there this year as a communications major. That's great, but how come she doesn't stay here? She wanted to live on campus. She would have been kind of isolated over here from other students, plus she would have had to fight traffic every morning to get to class. This works out better. She'll probably come over on weekends when she needs to get away from the school. Makes sense. L.A. has enough traffic during the rush hours. What about you? Are you staying out here now? No, we're just here temporarily while I go to interviews for work. If nothing comes up, Mom and I will be leaving at the end of this week. I'm surprised that your agent hasn't been able to find you something. Oh, he has. I've done some commercials and two movies since I saw you last fall. Bud spoke up for the first time, isn't that you in the car commercials that we've been seeing during the past couple of weeks? It sure looks like you. It probably is. There are three different ones running. I knew it. I told you, Chet. What movies were you in? Have they been released yet? Not yet. I was in A Promise of Spring and Open Spaces, Closed Hearts. Big parts. Bud asked. Just supporting roles. The first lasted for three weeks, and the second required me for the summer. The summer? That means that you're probably in the initial credits? What do you mean initial credits? The credits that run at the beginning of the movie introducing the main actors. Everyone's in the trailing credits. Even I get listed there, along with the rest of the crew, and even the catering service. Being in the initial credits means that you have a significant role and name recognition, or they're introducing you as a new talent. It's one of the things that every actor strives for. Congratulations! Thanks! I don't know about the billing though. Has your name been announced anywhere yet in connection with the movie? Yes. They announced it on the news back home when a press release was sent out after my agent told them that I would like to do the picture. I hadn't even signed the contract yet. That settles it then. If you were in an early publicity release, then you'll almost certainly be in the initial credits. We'll know shortly if the shooting's been completed. It probably won't be out until the holidays, but the first one should be out any time now. We'll keep an eye out for them, Chet said. Maybe we'll have a chance to work together on a picture someday, that is, if you get a role in one that needs something blown up. I smiled and giggled at his statement. I'd like that. Are you working right now? I just finished a movie up in Canada and I've got another schedule to start in about a month. I'm just going to sit around and relax for a while, maybe do some scuba diving or surfing during the break. Sounds like you have it made. I do okay. It's a good life, Anne. I still have all my fingers. Now it was his turn to smile. You just have to be very careful when you're working and not let your concentration lapse. I met a stunt woman in the last movie. Her name is Sharon Oberson. Have you ever met her? Oh sure. Sharon's a real sweetheart. She looks a lot like you. In fact, you two could be sisters. I know her ex-boyfriend also. I've gone diving with him a few times. Too bad they split up, they always seemed made for each other. I haven't met him, but Sharon doubled for me in a car scene. I tried to reach her here, but her service told me that she's on a set in Spain. Bud said, that must be the new Rob Ludlow flick. I hear that they've got more stunt people than the rest of the crew put together. 
She probably won't be back for a couple of months. I guess that I'll have to try to catch up with her on my next trip. When will you be back again? I don't know. It depends on when I get another job. Not too long, I hope. We stayed out by the pool until mom called me in for dinner. I had told them more about the two movies that I had been in and they told me about their jobs. Bud was working at one of the studios at present, but Chet said that he'd probably see me around the pool over the next week if I were free in the afternoons. I went on more interviews during the following week and I saw Chet out at the pool twice more before it was time to go home. On Saturday morning, mom and I drove to the airport, turned in the rental car, and boarded our flight to Chicago. It was growing dark by the time that we got home. We had seen Carol once more before we left when she and Samantha came to the condo for dinner. On Monday, I returned to school. It was strange not having Carol around, and even stranger not having Brad there. Many of the girls that I had associated with last year had graduated, but I still had a lot of friends left and didn't lack for company on my first day back. In addition to my having to get started in my new classes, Fully one third of the cheerleaders had graduated, and although the new girls had been selected in the spring and had already attended a number of practice sessions, we still had to come together as a group through more practice. I had been excused from gym class last year, but it wasn't necessary this year. I could shower without any fear of discovery thanks to my real breasts and the surgical procedure. I was taking French 3, English 12. Calculus, and physics. Mom didn't make me take any more home economics or sewing courses this term. I would have more than enough credits to graduate with the four courses. In fact, I was only one credit short now, so just passing one of my courses would allow me to graduate, but I needed to do well in all the courses if I was to get into the college of my choice. In spite of the fact that I was surrounded by kids, I felt a little lost at first without the friends that had moved on to college or jobs. I hadn't really realized how many of my friends had been high school seniors last year. It almost didn't seem like the same school, but I especially missed Carol. We had grown so close during the past year, hardly ever being out of touch for more than an hour during the days. I began to get really sad and prayed that a job would appear that would take my mind off of things. During the first week of school, I was notified by Mr. Daniels that the promise of spring was to be released in a couple of weeks and I had been invited to the premiere. Mr. Daniels suggested that I go, and he arranged for an escort for me with one of his other clients, Wesley Ivers. Mr. Daniel said that it would be valuable exposure for both of us to be seen at the premiere. Since I very much wanted to work again, I agreed and we would travel to New York City for the weekend. After I had agreed to go to the premiere, we had the problem of what I should wear. Mom suggested that we stop and talk with Barbara first, so we called her and went to the theater. Barbara's response to my problem was to immediately start pulling dresses out to show me. She began explaining how much the first was like a creation that had been worn at the last Academy Awards, and another was almost identical to one worn at the last Grammy Awards, and a third was almost the image of one worn at the Tony Awards. As a wardrobe person Barbara played very close attention to fashion's trends. By the time we left the theater, Barbara had convinced us to let her make the gown for me. We left for New York City on Friday afternoon. For publicity purposes, we stayed at the Plaza Hotel this trip. I spent most of Saturday afternoon in the beauty salon, followed by a very, very light dinner. Wesley would pick me up an hour before the show and we would cruise around until it was time to make our entrance. Wesley arrived right on time and I only kept him waiting for about five minutes as I finished up my makeup. He complimented me on how beautiful I looked and I returned the compliment by telling him how handsome he looked in his tuxedo. Of course mom had to get a couple of pictures before we could leave. 
Before we entered the elevator, Wesley called the limo to tell the driver, who was parked around the corner, to meet us at the hotel entrance. He was just pulling up as we emerged from the hotel. We drove through Central Park until it was time to go over to the theater district, and then lined up behind several other limos waiting to discharge their passengers at the premiere. Photographers began snapping pictures as we emerged from the car and there were a couple of announcers speaking to video cameras as we walked towards the theater entrance. Both cameras swung in our direction as we approached, and one of the announcers moved in to talk with us. And here we have one of the stars of the new picture, Miss Crystal Ramsey. Miss Ramsey is here tonight with Wesley Ivers, who you'll remember from last year's The House on Sunset Lane. Miss Ramsey, would you tell our viewers what it was like to work with Cole Griffith and Heidi Morris? I had been prepared for the question by the agency and I rattled off my answer about how much I enjoyed the experience of working with such talented actors and such a wonderful script. I also praised the director and crew before it was time for the announcer to move on to the next arriving guest. There was another reporter further on who stopped me and asked where my gown was from. I replied that it was created for me by Barbara DeMilo. I received a strange look as the reporter tried to figure out who Barbara was, but I was already moving on. There were quite a few people inside the theater already. I recognized a number of people from the production staff. Mr. Willis, the director, and Mr. O'Brien, the producer welcomed me and we talked for a few minutes. Cole Griffith came in with his girlfriend and all attention turned to him as greetings were exchanged. A few minutes behind him was Heidi Morris and her date. Wes and I were included in the introductions and allowed to remain as part of the elite e group. We stood around and talked for perhaps ten minutes before being asked to take our seats. Ushers directed us to our seating and as soon as we were seated the rest of the audience was allowed in. Mr. O'Brien greeted the audience once everyone was seated and gave them a short welcoming speech. As he completed his remarks the house lights were lowered and the movie began. My first appearance came very early in the movie. What I had expected to be flashbacks were presented in the chronological order of the movie's timeline. Although I was only in a small number of the overall scenes, my presence throughout the movie made my part seem a lot larger. My final appearance was the confrontation scene between Heidi and myself near the very end of the movie. I found the movie to be a powerful, personal drama. Cole and Heidi did a wonderful job and if my opinion were any measure, the movie would be a success. My only surprise had been to see my name listed in the initial credits. It was the last one shown and presented as and introducing Crystal Ramsey. Since this was my first movie, the title was accurate. I remembered Bud and Chet's remarks about every new actor striving to have their name in the initial credits. I had come a long way very quickly, even if most moviegoers never noticed my name in the credits. Wes and I were invited to a private party, hosted by Mr. O'Brien, after the show. I guess that I was only expecting a party with a dozen or so guests, and so I certainly wasn't prepared for a party like the one that we found, but after all, this was a celebration of the release of a motion picture. Liquor was flowing freely, but I stuck with sparkling water as I mingled with more famous people than I can remember. There was a lot of a networking going on as people talked about their latest projects and promoted themselves for future projects. There didn't appear to be any lack of recreational pharmaceuticals either, for those that wanted them. Wesley was a lot better at working the room than I was and I stayed with him for the most part, but I also spent some time with Cole and Heidi. When I found myself in a group with Mr. O'Brien and Mr. Willis, I was temporarily the center of attention when Mr. O'Brien congratulated me on my role in open spaces, closed hearts. 
I thanked him and then responded to questions from several people in the group about how I felt about the character that I had played in A Promise of Spring. Wes and I stayed until almost 2 a.m. and then we thanked Mr. O'Brien, said our goodbyes to everyone that we passed on our way out, and left. The limo was waiting by the time that we exited the building and it was only a quick trip to the plaza. Wes walked me to my door, and although it wasn't a real date, I let him kiss me goodnight. I could taste the alcohol that he had drunk, and that must have been responsible for him trying to go further than just a kiss. I fended off his advances and said goodnight before opening the door and entering the room. When I closed the door he was still standing there watching me. I slept late, not getting up until after 10 o'clock. Mom had been up for hours but had let me sleep. When I awoke she ordered breakfast sent to the room, and I was able to complete my bath before breakfast arrived. As we ate, we looked through the newspaper that Mom had requested with breakfast. In the entertainment section was an article about the premiere. A picture with the article showed Heidi talking to the announcer. The article described the premiere and named the attendees. I found a section about me that read, Miss Ramsey wore an iced pink taffeta gown with spaghetti straps, a creation by Barbara DeMilo. A diamond choker, matching bracelet, and a chiffon wrap accessorized her gown. I smiled because the diamond choker and matching bracelet was from the theater but looked like the real thing to anyone but a jeweler with a loop. While the stones were fake, the settings were a very real 14K gold. The movie received a good review with three and a half stars, the maximum being four. I was mentioned only once in the review with, Crystal Ramsey gave an admirable performance as the former girlfriend. The description of my gown was longer, but I reminded myself that I wasn't looking for publicity, just enough notice to get another job. After breakfast we hurried to get ready to leave because we had a 2.30 flight out of LaGuardia. I took the newspaper to give to Barbara. I knew that it would tickle her tremendously to see her name mentioned with some of the most famous dress designers in the business. She really had done a wonderful job on the gown. Please subscribe for the next part and visit my Patreon page for early access. Link in the comment, thanks.